um, couple days um, getting started with school. Um, we're going to wait just a couple minutes while we get um, all of the attendees in and then we'll get started. So uh, take about 30 seconds or so uh, while uh, everyone joins us. All right, I'm gonna get started. Again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we wanna periodically um, offer a um, opportunity, a forum uh, for parents to uh, ask questions as we move through along these steps. Um, we started this week, um, obviously, and in a remote uh, week, and we just thank you for uh, being patient. We're all excited that we actually are back to school, even in the remote um, uh, week this week. Uh, I'm hearing great things uh, from parents and staff. And I uh, just, again, thank you for partnering with us. Um, we um, know that there's been um, some uh, issues with technology this week, and thank you for your patience. Um, I know that our uh, principals and our school staff and the IT department um, are all helping um, to get things. And that is some of the reason for the remote week um, is to kind of work out all the glitches, um, work out everything uh, in the beginning. Um, we always say go slow to go fast um, so that we can have a great um, school year. Uh, we're looking forward to next week uh, to actually uh, having some students uh, in person uh, while continuing to support our remote students. Uh, very excited about each step. And so we thought maybe you either had questions about just getting started or looking ahead to the next couple weeks and thought this was a good opportunity um, to have a forum for you to ask questions. As part of the panel today, um, we have um, all of our principals. If you guys would wave, uh, that would be great. I have um, our admin staff here that, that'll be here available. If you guys will wave, that'd be great. Um, I have two nurses, uh, school nurses with us today, um, Nurse uh, Sharon and Nurse Lori, if you guys, thank you. Uh, Dr. Parkinson, our consulting um, physician is here. And we have um, our IT support. Um, we have um, Cindy uh, Tugas and Mike uh, Falcone, if you guys will wave. And we have um, some um, uh, support around um, the teaching and learning components. So we have, um, a department head, Sarah uh, Cox, thank you, and Stacy Strong and, and uh, Robin Bowerman, uh, thank you. And I think, I'm looking around, I think I've, I've got everyone. So we, we're here to answer any type of questions that you have, as you can see uh, from the panel. So I don't wanna delay this any longer. We have an hour, uh, we'll be ending um, at uh, seven o'clock tonight. Uh, so please add your questions into the chat. Uh, and Ryan Weber is our moderator tonight, and he will be um, asking the questions and directing them to someone on the panel. Um, thank you again, and let's get started. All right, so I do have the chat open at the bottom. For those of you unfamiliar with Zoom at this point, you'll just go down to the bottom of your screen, click on the chat, and then you should be able to type questions with any of the panelists. We'll be able to see those questions, and I'll be happy to relay any of those. So we'll get to those as soon as we can. And Mike, while we're um, waiting for um, some questions uh, to come in, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, kind of getting up and running and what it's been like um, with the um, technology this week? Of course, it's, uh, it's been a very, very busy week. Um, obviously, it's been a busy summer, but this week, not only did we have all our teaching staff um, teaching remotely for the beginning of the year, but all the students in the district 100% remote this week. So uh, we started the week with a lot of tech support issues and um, my staff has been doing a great job trying to catch up on those. We did get uh, quite a bit behind Monday morning when you know, got a few thousand all at once and it was actually so much that the, uh, the Google Mail server stopped sending some of the tickets through the system because it, was, uh, it looked like we were getting spammed by them. But I think as of today, we're most of the way caught up responding and helping uh, 
our teachers and our families get through the issues they're having with the technology. Um, I know a lot of people are having issues with Zoom, especially with some of the older Chromebooks that we have out there. Uh, Monday night, Google released an update it, um, on the older Chromebooks. It will actually reduce the uh, resolution of the video slightly so that it will take less bandwidth and less processor power so that hopefully uh, you'll see better performance on those older devices on the, in the Zoom meetings. It'll mean your, uh, your students' uh, resolution on their screen won't be as high def, but it should uh, be less glitchy and more of a smooth picture for them. Okay, great. And Mike, um, just if, if people have issues, can you just tell um, where the ad, what the address is? So um, the, the best way right now to get uh, tech support, you can email CB Repair, which stands for Chromebook Repair. It was uh, originally our tech support for the students in the one-to-one -one program. So it's CB Repair at falmouth.k12.ma.us. And we've also made a phone number available this week. If, um, if you can't send an email or you just really need to get someone on the phone, if you call 508-457-5418, someone will answer that phone and try to, um, if she's able to help you, if it's something basic, if not, then she can direct um, it to the correct tech support person who can give you the best help. All right, thanks for starting us off on that. I assume that we might have had some questions about that. Uh, Ryan, sorry, I'll turn that back over to you. I think we have some questions now. Yes, we do, thank you. So the first question is a two-parter um, to bring it back together. Uh, the first part of it is how much live teaching is my second grader supposed to get or will be getting? Um, and then there was a follow-up, I'm talking about a second grader who is fully remote. Dr. Tyer? Sure. Um, I'm actually going to um, start to frame this and I'm going to ask one of our elementary uh, math coaches to build off of that. Um, so we are working through the process um, of beginning to communicate and acclimate our students to Zoom into the learning routines and the fully remote classes and starting to introduce concepts and they, they will go off and have some time with independent work and come back. Um, I'd like to ask Stacy Strong to pick up on that because she's been helping um, teachers develop the learning for that and also was part of the Summer Learning Academy where we started to um, develop that model a little bit more uh, closely. So Stacy, could you add to that please? Oh, you're muted. Sure, sorry. Um, so in the Summer Learning Academy we kind of developed this model where um, teachers begin the day with uh, an introduction and, and kind of set the tone or set out a playlist for what's going to happen that day. Um, and then maybe teach a short lesson through um, video or, uh, you know, uh, other means and then, um, and then send the kids off to, to do some some projects and then the idea is that they come back and check in various times during the day so it's not a one and done it's a, a various check-in robin do you want to expound um hi yes uh so as uh, math coaches we've uh provided a variety of resources for um the teachers to use in their remote setting including uh, both high-tech, uh, high um, low-tech, and no-tech. So the goal is to provide students with a, an opportunity to have engaged learning and not be on the Chromebooks all the time. We have a wonderful math program that is puzzle-based and that is on the pro, um, Chromebook, ST Math, but we have also um, provided other resources and Stacy created a wonderful STEM program uh, over the summer with the Summer Learning Academy. Um, and then I would just add that as we work to build a rhythm and find out um, how our students work independently, um, what we're trying to do is also create open drop-in sessions for students to be able to check in with their teacher during that time where they're working independently. Um, to be able to have someone that they can reach back to if they need any type of support or clarification or extension of their work. All right, thank you everyone. 
Um, I'm going to take the question slightly out of order. Mr. Falcone, could you repeat that phone number again for tech support just a little bit slower? I'm not sure if everyone quite got that the first time. Yeah, I, I, I tend to move kind of fast with a lot of things, so I apologize if I'm talking too fast. So um, that phone number is 508-457-5418. And uh, also the email address is cbrepair at falmouth.k12.ma.us. So once again, the phone number is 508-457-5418. And the email address is cbrepair at falmouth.k12.ma.us. All right, and Ryan, before you um, take off to the next question, I just wanted to uh, announce that Scott McGann, our Falmouth Health agent, has joined us as well on the panel, just in case you have any questions for Scott. Thank you, Scott, for being here. All right, back to Ryan. All right, the next question is, why are remote teachers not given a landing page on the FPS website? I think that will be Dr. Tellier. Yes, I can answer that. Um, actually, our, all of our remote teachers had created landing pages. One of the things that we learned was that some of them were posted to one of the schools with which the remote teachers associated. However, each remote uh, teacher is tied to two schools. Um, so we worked this afternoon through that issue and they are now um, all posted to the school websites um, to which they're affiliated. So that's why we'll see that some of our teachers are posted to multiple schools. It's because the students in the remote um, only classroom um, come from two different schools. Great, thank you. Next question, a uh, question on bus passes. When I filled out the survey, it said my seventh grader would not need a bus pass this year. However, we received one in the mail today. Should I return it? We'll follow up with you tomorrow. We've got your name. Thanks. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm gonna try to get, so we can get through a number of questions from everyone, just to make sure we can get everyone's answered. I'll take them slightly out of order. Um, even the newer Chromebooks are experiencing high CPU, C, CPU usage. Are there fixes in the works for this? Yes, um, I've actually been uh, conferencing with a lot of the other tech directors in Massachusetts and um, to actually talked to a representative from Zoom early this morning for some uh, help in it. One of the issues that a lot of the Chromebooks are having is even if they're not using Bluetooth devices, the um, Bluetooth is enabled by default, and that's been taking up a lot of uh, processor cycles on the devices. So this morning, we uh, disabled Bluetooth on all the devices. We did uh, get a few requests from people that have wireless keyboards that, uh, and wireless mice that wanted to use Bluetooth. So as we got those requests, and if we get any more, we'll be happy to uh, re-enable Bluetooth on those devices, but we'll be letting the families know that it might slow down the devices. So Hopefully today, with some of the changes that we made uh, last night and this morning, we're going to see uh, a bit of improvement on uh, the performance of these devices. Um, and obviously, we're going to keep looking into what we can do to make them faster. I mean, they are devices that were designed for basically browsing the internet, and now we've given them to everyone in the world, and we're trying to do as much as possible with them. So we are hitting some technological limitations of them. But as, um, as we run into more difficulties, we're troubleshooting and trying to come up with as many options as we can to make them function uh, better for the, as learning devices that we need them to be. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, should parents not allow students to play on playgrounds before and or after school since they will not be allowed to play on them during school? Patrick, do you want to take that or you want me to answer? Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, the playgrounds have been open all summer. Um, our, the guidance for the schools is a little different than um, the town. So the playgrounds have been open and it's been um, with um, guidance at the playgrounds about using them. Um, just, you know, really suggesting that, you know, uh, hand sanitizer, washing your hands uh, and such. The, the playgrounds during the school time, if we were to use the playgrounds, we would have to clean the playground equipment between use. And it's just not possible um, to be, uh, we just don't have enough uh, support um, to be able to do that. Uh, it's just, it's manpower. And so because we, we can't keep them clean between uh, use or even between student use uh, for a group of students uh, because of the way you use playground equipment, um, they would be, you know, 
just crossing over with the equipment in. And because of that, for safety reasons, we have decided not to use them during school. Um, the playgrounds are open. They are uh, they belong to the town. So before after school, that um, that's a parent decision, um, not a school decision. Okay. The next question, I have two people that have asked fairly similar. So I'll ask them both. And Dr. Telly, if you might take the lead, and we can kind of farm the rest it out. How different will remote instruction at Morris Pond and Lawrence look when students are in school? Was one question that someone asked. The other one was, could you explain how live instruction will be delivered at Lawrence and Lawrence when the students, some of the students are in the classroom where others will be remote? So I can speak to how it will look at Lawrence and then maybe Dr. Reardon can uh, talk about MP and that you can uh, talk about the similar similarities and differences. Uh, so at Lawrence, there's a there's an expectation for the students that are remote on days when students are going to be in person for them to be uh, to be participating synchronously at the beginning of the class for attendance, uh, introduction of new material, and uh, whatever elements of the lesson that the teachers wish to have the students there for them. So that will be four times a day, uh, minus bulldog time, where students who are remote will likely be uh, going to a bulldog time assignment that will be posted. So at least four times a day for, uh, for you know, up to, up to 80 minutes, really, if the, if the staff members choosing to keep the kids in the classroom that long virtually, uh, they'd be expected to be participating in real time with uh, the students who are in the classroom during face-to-face -face instruction. Dr. Reardon, I think you have to unmute. Guys, I may have to step back for one second. I, my 90-year-old father lives with me and he talks very, very loudly. So even though I'm in my office with the door closed. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, very much like Tom said, we are not on a block schedule at Morse Pond. They have two teachers and a teaching team. Some have three. Um, but the way that we've structured the instruction, structured the instruction, is that we're having three core classes during the course of the day and a special. So again, there'll be four times when the students are engaged. The instruction and expectation of teachers is that they're doing a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. So much like um, Mr. Bushy just mentioned, a teacher might be doing a math lesson, a mini math lesson for 20 minutes, where the students that are at home are engaged in the lesson, they're viewing what we now have at Morris Pond, um, clear touch uh, screens. They're huge 72 inch screens that the children can watch the instruction while the teacher is zooming. So there's that, that combination of, of both video screens going on at the same time. And then, you know, we wanna balance that with, we don't want kids on the Chromebooks, you know, 24 seven. So at once the lesson uh, starts, then afterward the students might be participating in um, asynchronous work. Um, the teachers that I've been talking to are really trying to create a really positive balance between the two. So some of the activities too on the Chromebook can actually be um, fun games and activities that they can do for their math. So we've um, purchased a lot of software thanks to Dr. Tellier um, for our teachers to use Rolf Math and for ELA. Um, I, I, hopefully I answered your question. I'm not sure if you were looking for something more than that, but if you are, I'm happy to answer it. I think there was a little bit more, which I didn't quite read about the remote students on the Zoom, remotely observing the in-person teaching as well, if you might be able to speak a little to that. I know you already did cover it to a certain point. Are you saying uh, the remote students that are on Zoom being able to see the students that are face-to-face? -face? Yeah, the hybrid, how the hybrid kind of works in particular. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. That with the A Be able to help equal. with that a little? Um, if, I, if I understand the question, uh, they were asking if the remote students would be able to see the students in the classroom that they're participating with. And um, if I'm correct about that, the answer is right now we're actually in the process of distributing external webcams to all the teachers in the district so that they can have a camera set up outside their computer that they can then aim at the class, they can aim at the board, and they can Put the remote students in different portions of the classroom. We've been uh, spending a few months trying to track down enough of this technology from uh, resources all over the place because it's 
very high demand, but we finally have enough of these cameras for every teacher in the district. And we've, we've got a lot of the tripods in place and we're still waiting on some longer wires, but uh, I'm in the process of getting all the technology that we actually have right now out to the teachers so that if they do want to use these cameras to put the students at home more in the classroom, they are available to them at this point. Great, thank you for Mr. Falcone. Um, next question is, uh, the current plan states that in-person students will return to schools on October 13th. Will they be in school all five days, uh, full or half according to the cohort? When should we expect to receive the new schedule in person starting 1013? I'm sorry, I don't know which school this is, unfortunately, that they're asking. We can answer from a couple different levels, um, uh, just in case of one of the elementaries, they're probably on uh, mostly the same schedule. If someone would like to, to jump in, we'll start there. Sandy? I don't, um, sure. So at the elementary level, um, the students who are returning um, in person will return the five days a week, <clears throat> excuse me, starting the 13th. And then we do have, you know, there, if you see the um, school calendar, there are some planned half days, but in general, the students will be in school five days a week. Okay, and then let's go with the secondary, um, um, talking about the schedule. I don't know if Kathleen or Tom want to, or Mary, one of you want sure, to take I'm, one. I'm happy to jump in, um, Dr. Durr. So at Morse Pond, um, we sort of went in line with what they're doing at Lawrence in the high school so that hopefully siblings can be together on their off weeks. We have basically two cohorts, cohort A, cohort B, that are going to be in the buildings for hybrid. So next week, just to sort of ease in, we're doing half of each cohort. So for example, next week on Monday and Tuesday, it's cohort A1 for a half day. Wednesday is remote and then A2 for the next two days. The unique piece that we have is we have an opportunity for parents to sign up their children to be in the building when they're doing the remote work. So we recognize that our students are a little bit younger than the high school obviously, and parents might want to have daycare. So we've set up four distinct locations in the cafeteria separated and have hired staff assistants um, to supervise the students. So they'll be doing their remote work basically instead of on their couch in our cafeteria. They'll still have the same breaks and so forth. So um, I mentioned this only because next week when we're half day for the A's, the B students who are in the remote center will be able to come in. The following week, it'll be half day for B's and the A students in the remote learning center can come in. Those are just those have, that have applied for that. Once we do that, we're gonna go into a regular A week, B week, A week, B week, and we're following the exact same schedule that uh, Lawrence and the high school are. Just to, uh, the, sorry, the 13th is a Tuesday, so that is a four day week. Uh, it was a long weekend that week, but that will be the full A week, and then the following week is the, the full B week. Uh, students should know which cohort they're assigned to now. If you don't, uh, definitely uh, give, a school call, give the school a call to try and make sure you're squared away with getting onto uh, power school so you can identify which cohort your child is in. Yeah, it's the same at the high school. And I was going to mention what um, Mr. Bushy just said. The cohort assignment is right at the top of a student's schedule in power school. And for the high school level, if the best way to view a student's schedule in power school is under the my schedule option um, because otherwise you get a list view and it doesn't make sense my schedule will show you a nice matrix schedule and um we're doing the same thing that dr reardon mentioned the half days next week with cohort a then the half days the following week with cohort b and then starting on the 13th we will have a in and then the following week b in and alternating from that point on I think the other thing that's important to mention too that applies to all three of our schools is that um, there are going to be remote Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. I think most people know that at this point in time, but if it's a four day week, we will not have remote Wednesday. That way, whoever the week belongs to, whether it's A's or B's, they will still have four days in school. And at the high school, I am sending out a communication to families tomorrow with information about the schedule. I always feel bad sending out those communications because they're so long and detailed and I know they're confusing, but 
if anyone has any questions, you can always call me at 508-540-2200 and my direct extension is 4050. Mrs. Gans, could you repeat that a little slower, please? Yeah, get that yep. for yeah. everyone's connection. 508-540-2200, extension 4050. Or you can email me as well. So I'm, I'm always happy to answer any questions. Great. I'm going to take a couple of the questions just quickly out of order because we were talking about a little housekeeping stuff. One was if this recording, if this was going to be recorded, which the answer is yes, we'll be getting that out onto YouTube and also on channel 14. Uh, it's not being broadcast on channel 14 right now. Unfortunately, there's only the ability to go live from one location and it's being used elsewhere at the moment. Um, and the question after that is for Mr. Falcone. Oh, it just jumped. Um, is there a way to disable YouTube from a school issued Chromebook? Is YouTube needed for classwork at Lawrence? Um, yeah, YouTube's always been an issue over the years because um, there's a lot of great content on it. And unfortunately, there's some uh, not great content and there's a lot of time wasters on there. Um, I think a lot of the teachers are using YouTube in their classes. If, um, if, it's, if you're having some issues with your particular student that you're worried about YouTube, I would encourage you to contact the principal of that building and maybe we could find a way that um, we could give them alternatives besides YouTube and then look into disabling the YouTube on the device. But I do know that a lot of teachers do use some instructional videos on YouTube and we actually create a lot of content in house that we broadcast on YouTube. So. Ideally, we want to be able to keep it working on all the students' devices, but if, if we're not able to for certain reasons, we might be able to make some other accommodations. Mike, maybe you want to talk about uh, Securely, which was referenced in the uh, previous parent group? Yeah, okay. Well, there's, um, there's, there's two different pieces of software made by Securely that we're using now. Um, one of them, we're using their content filtering software so that when your students are online at home on the school issued Chromebooks, there's a small amount of content filtering on. So it will uh, attempt to block inappropriate activity if they're you know, going to websites that you wouldn't want your kids to go to. Um, where we don't monitor what sites they're going to. It just, if certain sites are attempted to go to by the students when they're um, off campus, the uh, computer software will notice those sites and just block the sites from loading. That software is obviously not foolproof because new sites come up every day and the people that run inappropriate sites want the web traffic, so they try to make ways for people to get around it. So it's, it's a layer of protection that helps out a little bit, but it's not perfect. So I would still encourage monitoring what your uh, children are doing on the internet when they're on any devices, whether it's the school Chromebook or phone or anything else like that. The, um, I'm assuming that's the Securely product Mr. Bushy asked about, but we also recently uh, purchased the Securely Classroom product, which is um, it's a classroom management software for the Chromebooks. It allows the teachers to see the Chromebook screens of everybody in their class. Um, and it also allows them to share screens. It allows them to send a web page to the devices. If um, I actually got an email from a teacher today at Morse Pond that she was very excited. She saw that a kid was on TikTok and she closed TikTok and sent a message to keep on task and the student was uh, back on task for the rest of the class. And uh, obviously we need that software this year because the teachers can't walk around and see all the screens in their classroom even never mind the remote students. So um, we have that product too. Um, but I think it was the first one Mr. Bushy was asking about. Great, thank you. The next question is for um, Mr. McGann and Dr. Parkinson. The letter from the school nurse states, to keep your student home if they have any of the symptoms listed. Uh, two of the symptoms are sore throat and nasal congestion, which we know with youngest learners happens pretty con constantly. The return to guideline, school guidelines is not to return for school to 10 days if a COVID test is not done. Would you suggest we get our child tested every time they have a stuffy nose or sore throat? I can take that one. Stuffy nose, no. Sore throat, yes. Um, there are exceptions to sore throats that an individual doctor with a child who has a very uh, specific condition 
who may have been already at least previously tested once for um, for COVID during that illness may. Um, sore throat's considered a key symptom. Uh, nasal congestion in association with other things such as cough, sore throat, fever, vomiting, loss of taste or smell, you all know the list, would constitute uh, a reason. Isolated nasal congestion that's mild um, in and of itself is not a reason to have to be excluded. It's difficult, but that's, that's where it's at. Great, thank you. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions about before and after care. Um, Mr. Murphy, I think you're on, yeah. right? Sure. Um, we met with the YMCA on Monday. They have been able to commit to providing before and after care uh, staffing, and we can provide space at the four elementary schools. We have uh, room for uh, two cohorts of 13. Each, the staffing levels are required to be uh, one to 13 or less and uh, physically distanced uh, at each school for before and after school at the elementary levels right now. We are meeting again on Friday. They're gonna provide updates on um, their staffing levels and what they can continue to commit to and we'll continue to, to discuss where, um, where additional staff uh, should be allocated. The, um, the question about Morse Pond that I see down, uh, down the road there um, is we're also looking to identify additional community resources to help parents out with, um, with some child care um, uh, programming in, uh, in Falmouth. So we're uh, continuing to work on that, but the before and after care for the four elementary schools, uh, by the way, there is a commitment to providing some uh, seats given the staffing that we have and given the, the space that we have available to us. Mr. Murphy, I have a follow-up question about bus passes. If uh, the parent required a bus pass but didn't pick it up on Wednesday, how do you obtain one prior to Monday? Uh, they, I believe most of the bus passes were allocated to the schools. We can uh, follow up directly. Oh, uh, they, were, they were mailed out by Greg Kennedy. Okay. But, but the parent would want to connect connect with Greg Kennedy to confirm that they're on the bus pass list. Okay, so we will just need the to confirm the name then. Ryan, can I go back to the sore throat question for one sec? Please. That one addendum to that is if there's a specific diagnosis like strep throat or mono or hand, foot, and mouth, where it's clearly something on other that's specifically diagnosable then you would default to whatever the return to school for that particular illness would be and not have to wait 10 days. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Mr. Falcone, a lot of tech questions tonight. Uh, I cannot log into PowerSchool and I'm not getting automated reset emails. It just says email the school. Who do I email to reset my PowerSchool password? All right, um, the easiest way would uh, be to call that phone number I gave out earlier, which I'll give you again. Um, the woman who uh, answers that phone is actually the person who is in charge of resetting the password. So you could obviously email the CB repair at falmouth.k12.ma.us, which will get in that queue that all my tech support staff gets. But if you call 508-457-5418, um, um, the person who answers the phone will be able to help you out. She'll be able to reset your password. If you're having problems logging in besides the password, she can probably troubleshoot some of those with you also. Um, Mr. Falcone's follow-up question. My child has been using her own Chromebook. Will she be bringing it back and forth to school or will she be using a school-owned Chromebook at Mullen Hall? Um, at Mo we've, we've assigned Chromebooks to every single student. So um, all the students at the elementary schools that are having in-person classes will have the devices waiting in the classrooms ready for them. So I would uh, recommend you not having your student travel with them because they'll have a device ready to use at school and um, not traveling with a device will reduce the risk of them breaking their device. The, um, the students that are using school-owned devices at that grade level aren't bringing them home. They're only using them during the school day. So there's uh, 
there's no need to bring one back and forth. Um, next question, I think, is Mrs. Gans. I think it's this level. Um, can you speak about the French and Spanish classroom situation? I think that's uh, I think that's me, Ryan. Okay, sorry, I didn't know the grade level. So, yeah. So, so uh, first, first off, I, I, you know, I want to identify and acknowledge that uh, this is a this is our most significant uh, scheduling challenge so far this year at the start of the year, and I apologize to the families that this is impacted and uh you know i mean that sincerely because uh, my child is personally impacted by this scenario as well uh, i just want to address a couple points here we we do have the the students fill out uh, the course registration form in the spring and clearly state that they may not get their first pick uh, we also did uh, issue uh, at least two times uh, in my family communication uh, an acknowledgement that the world languages might be impacted with some schedule changes. Still, though, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, uh, I want to uh, give a nod to the superintendent that uh, she is working with us to try to uh, accommodate as many of the original requests for students who selected Spanish as possible. Uh, in fact, we were uh, conferencing today to try and come up with some uh, some specific resolutions here. Uh, we know that it's not the uh, children's first pick. Uh, but we want to make uh, as many, we want to accommodate as many families as possible, if not all of them. Um, I, I will say there's only so much I could speak to about it, though, because one of the challenging hangups is revolves specifically around an individual's uh, personal uh, personnel matter. So uh, that's been a challenge for us to navigate as well. Uh, but I, the families that I'm in contact with now, I am asking just for some time while we work on this. Uh, in conjunction with the other, um, you know, uh, growing challenges that we're we're facing, and happy to address, uh, but we just need some time to try to get something squared away and communicate with the families that have been impacted. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, I'll put out to the group. I'm not sure who would be the one to answer. If a child has to miss school for the first for ten days, um, I believe that's probably for quarantine. Uh, how would they receive schooling? Do they jump into remote, remote for a period of time? Is the remote and in-person learning following the same plan? So one of the reasons that um, we did do a full remote this week uh, so that all students have the remote, we make sure that everyone can be connected. Um, certainly from grades five to 12, um, students will be uh, remote you know, one week or the other and on Wednesday, uh, Wednesdays. But at the elementary level, um, there are students that uh, are full remote, but there's also students that are uh, full in person. At some point during this year, um, a couple of different things could happen. We could all be remote, um, or there could be a student from time to time, as this question is, is indicating, um, if you have to uh, quarantine for the 10 days or for the, for the 14 days um, for an exposure, that um, you you're already set up and have that capability of connecting uh, with remote. Uh, certainly if a child is uh, sick and unable to do that, we wouldn't expect that. But if a child is just home because maybe they uh, have been exposed, so they have to do the 14 days quarantine, or if they have symptoms, uh, maybe they're mild symptoms, they may have to still be home, but they still uh, may feel well enough to be in bed, but still connect. So you, the children have options to um, continue to get their um, education and not miss a beat um, by being at home or being in school. And this is one of the reasons uh, in the grander plan that we had, um, that we knew that these situations would come up. So uh, yes, to answer, that was a long way of saying yes. Um, uh, the students can connect remotely while at home uh, and just continue um, their learning seamlessly. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, how will the decision to use outdoor classrooms be made in terms of weather and or which classes get to utilize? So we can have a couple different principals answer that. Um, uh, you know, Mr. Goodhine, uh, would you like to uh, take this one for the elementary and talk about sure. um, your plans for that? So we're, uh, we're gonna establish kind of like a, a sign up for the, like, uh, like a Google, Google Doc sign up sheet for use of certain parts of the building. There's certain parts that are um, very popular, like the courtyard, for example. We're, we're going to be able to use at least two, if not three, areas for outdoor classrooms there. 
Um, there are many classroom areas outside of the building as well, outside kindergarten, preschool, in the back of the building. Um, we've been working with some folks through the Rotary Club to uh, establish some outdoor learning act, uh, spaces. We've had a number of really interesting uh, tree stumps delivered. I mean, 40 or 50 tree stumps um, cut logs, which are really actually quite nice and perfect sizes for seats for younger kids. I believe Eversource donated some really large uh, electrical spools, and those are used as tables in the center of the circle. So we've got a lot of that around the building. Um, we have some tents set up as well. So we don't have enough outdoor spaces for every teacher all day throughout the day. So we are gonna rotate the use of those spaces and probably use a, um, a Google sign-up sheet for that. Uh, Kathleen, we'll just, just kind of go at the age levels here. <laughs> We're really excited about the outdoor learning spaces. We're really fortunate at Morris Pond to have a huge field and then we've got some space in the back and then we have another field out behind. So thank you to Mr. Murphy for reaching out to the rec department and not the rec department, excuse me, um, the town to be um, mowing that on a regular basis. So we have designated specific areas for PE. Um, the PE teachers will be taking the kids out and using the softball field as well as that backfield that I just referenced. And then we're allocating certain areas for teachers to use. And, the way that we're going to do that is put it onto a Google Doc. So rather than scheduling a teacher and saying you have to take your kids out at this time, we want it to be more natural and you know not take somebody out of their math class or take somebody out of their special. So teachers will be able to, you know, if they feel like the kids need a little movement break, <laughs> need a mask break, they can go into the Google Doc, see what's available, and then take their kids outside. Um, we do have two tents right now, and we also have about 60 stumps. Um, we also have on their way, coming from Ohio, some really cool seating for kids, little plastic seating that they can use that actually has a little laptop that comes, lap desk like thing that comes on top. So there are gonna be some seating options for them out there and um, some taller, more comfortable seating for the teachers. Um, so there will be very specific locations allocated to the outdoor learning as well as for mass breaks and play. We also are fortunate to have that garden center in the very middle of our building. Um, which we're going to allow people to use as well. Did you want to keep going up? Yeah. Yes, Go yeah. yeah. So uh, we have uh, seven dedicated outdoor sp learning spaces. Uh, we do have the two tents and uh, we've provisioned for other areas outside of the school building. We're managing the outdoor learning spaces on team. So we've got six teams at the school. Each team uh, has five uh, assigned uh, learning groups, student groups, and on team, they'll be able to manage the outdoor learning spaces equitably. For example, uh, if, if uh, the art teacher who's teaching on a certain team's trimester decides to take every one of their groups over the two period, uh, two court days, I'm sorry, uh, then we'll know that each learning group will get a chance to access the outdoor learning space over the course of the two days. Uh, we also have uh, our world language teachers, which are which uh, teach off team. So we didn't want them to have to uh, compete with on team classes for access to the spaces. So we've established a learning space with them, and uh, we will rotate the learning spaces because, like I said, some are more desirable than others. But uh, the team the team leaders are prepared to manage them, and uh, we're pretty confident that they'll get uh, a very good amount of use. So at the high school, um, for now, we have the two tents that are mostly going to be dedicated to the band and chorus um, teachers. I haven't had a huge demand, uh, much demand at all from other teachers for the outdoor learning spaces, but I do know teachers can take students outside and they don't need to be in the tents either. Um, so we've let the teachers know that they can go out, bring their classes out as long as they just follow the safety protocols, they're all set. Great, thank you all. Um, the next question has been asked by a few people. Could we get some, please get some clarification. Yeah. Chromebooks. Yes, about the yeah. school assigned Chromebooks versus the personal used one if people did not get the school issued one, they opted for So it. I, um, I, I read all those questions, they, they were coming up, so I think I can uh, clear up some of the confusion. So at the, uh, the elementary schools, the K to four level, we did um, assign a device to every student. A lot of the families have picked them up and are using them already. But the, uh, 
the plan for the in-person students is that those the, the devices that they'll be using in school so if they do have those devices at home for the remote start of the school year once they're going to full in person in school they should be bringing those devices and the chargers for them into uh into school that first day they go back and we've provided all the uh classrooms at that age group with uh basically cabinets that will wire those uh the chargers for the Chromebooks into so that the students will have their own Chromebooks in their own charger, but they'll plug them in at the end of the day so that they'll um, be charged up and ready to go the next morning. Um, if the students at those grade levels are fully remote, then obviously they're going to keep that device at home and use it at home for, uh, you know, their, their, their remote learning. At Morse Pond and uh, Lawrence in the high school, whether you're um, in the uh, hybrid model, yeah, I guess if you're in the hybrid model, you're gonna be going into school, but you'll use that on your remote weeks and your in-school weeks. So those students will be traveling back and forth with the devices as they did last year. But um, once again, at the elementary levels, where having everyone having their own device is a new thing. We do not want the students to have to travel with them. They won't have homework on these devices. So once they're in person, um, they'll be expected to bring the device back to school and it'll be stored at school for them. Can I just, can I jump in for a moment? Um, I just want to answer, one was specific to Morse Pond and I, I'm not sure that we narrowed it down to the, the question. Um, so if students have their own Chromebooks at home, that's perfectly fine, of course, and they can certainly still get a Chromebook for school. The only thing is, is that at the end of their remote learning week, I mean, excuse me, at the end of their in-school week, they will need to take their supplies home. So you can bring yours back and forth, your own personal one, or you can use the schools. But at the end of the week, the classrooms are gonna be all cleaned down for the next cohort to come in. So they won't be storage to leave it there. So the option is to use your own or not. And I, and I, if I could just clarify something at the elementary level, there was a question in the chat with regard to the Chromebooks. And what Mr. Falcone had said is that students at the elementary level will not be bringing their Chromebooks back and forth to school, which is true starting October 13th. However, until then, when we're on the, um, on the schedule for the next two weeks, the students will need to bring their Chromebooks back and forth to school. However, if you have a if you have a device at home, um, you don't need to bring that into school. We do have um, dedicated devices at school for the students, but if they're using a school issued Chromebook, then they will need to bring that back and forth. All right. Thank you. I skipped over those two weeks because I'm just excited to see everybody back in school full time. Okay. Uh, the next question reads: Are students that are 100% in person that have not been quarantined in our home for whatever reason and show up in a virtual classroom, able to be marked present and participate. Kind of like toggling between in-person and remote, even if they show up in person the next day. How will parents know what the response from the district will be? So attendance um, uh, will be taken uh, whether you're remote or whether you're in person. Um, so if, uh, I guess, you know, you need I'm not sure why then if they're not quarantined, it could be for any other number of reasons that a student might be home. I assume the school would know why the, the student's at home. Again, I wouldn't, if a student is too ill to um, attend even remotely from home, then um, I think we, we treat that as an absence like we would any other time. We're not expecting students if they're ill to be able to, to um, connect to the learning. But if they uh, are in a situation that they need to be home, uh, but could connect um, with the um, school, with the teacher, then um, yes, we welcome that and um, they would be present, uh, counted present. Um, the, so I'm, I'm saying it generically. I think that each individual case, parents should be working with um, the principals uh, and or the nurses or and whatever else that decision might be individual reason for the child to be home. Um, so I'm not sure I'm trying to answer it uh, broadly and specifically at the same time because I'm not sure I understand the, the full question. Um, but just know that if you're remote and you're home and you can connect, yes, you'd be counted present. 
Um, follow up question to that that I just saw it came across. What happens if a student missed the bus? Can they be remote for the day? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, next question, I'm bouncing back and forth and I apologize if we don't get to everyone's but I'm trying to get as many as we can. Um, how will my child learn new concepts for math fully remote? Uh, follow up for same for reading and English in second grade. How is my child going to be evaluated? I think we have one for the math coaches. <laughs> So at the elementary level for K through two, we have remote teachers um, that will be giving instruction. Um, this is not all asynchronous. This is uh, live instruction. They will be using a program called ST Math um, to give the students robust practice within those, um, within those topics. Um, and then in grades three and four, it's a hybrid uh, where the remote students kind of come into the classroom for part of the day and then go off um, and do their assignments and then check back in with their teacher. Does that, did that answer the question? I think a bit. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about ST Math? I know that's come up, I think, earlier. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> um, so ST Math is a, uh, an online learning program um, that we are fortunate enough to have a grant uh, for. Um, this is a highly sought after program um, across the country. And it has an independent, it, so ST stands for spatial temporal, which um, allows students to build a, a foundation in mathematics, right? It, from K through four, back in the day, students were learning math naturally by playing with coins, by having a paper route, by doing all these things. But now, you know, even video games have counters, so they don't get that experience. ST Math has made a learning process through puzzles where students internalize lessons and build a, a schema, um, a, a strong foundation in math concepts. Um, there's some independent work. And then in this environment that is remote and hybrid, it provides a great platform for teachers to host a classroom discussion with remote learners and in-class learners. Uh, Robin and I hosted one today. Um, and. Uh, yeah, we had some happy customers. <laughs> um, so I'm excited. I, I don't want to take up the rest of the time in this talk, but uh, I'm excited about the math opportunity, the math learning opportunities. Um, it's a research-based program built by neuroscientists and mathematicians. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dur, we only have, I think, five minutes left, correct? Correct. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to make sure if we could try to get to a few last questions, we can. And I'm sorry we not get all of them, but um, I guess a follow up to the previous question about some of the remote teaching. Um, does the school prefer students who are in person to avoid tardy or early dismissal appointments to opt for virtual that day, or should we adhere the normal way? And I think there was one other one, but we'll go with that for right now. So th the nice thing about uh, now that we, um, we are set up for remote, that if you did have an appointment, um, you could connect remotely uh, for the other portion of the day. Um, I think that I would rather the parent um, work with the principal at each school um, to determine what would be best. But I do think that we have those options now that we didn't have um, pre-COVID days um, that, you know, the parents. And so sometimes it is difficult call for parents to get um, students to doctors and then get them to school or, um, you know, in reverse. So I think we have options. Just, uh, I would just suggest please working with um, the principal um, on what's best for the po protocols per building. Great. Thank you. Um, question about remote learning. Will homework be adjusted this year so students that are always already working remotely for a full day will not have a lot of screen time after the school day ends? Dr. Tellier, you want to talk about homework? <laughs> Um, so we've spent a lot of time talking about um, the difference between setting an objective and providing some asynchronous, the, the asynchronous learning time through the playlist and homework and recognizing that some students may fulfill the objective sooner and some students may take longer and sort of building the work around fulfilling the objective as opposed to drawing a line and saying this is technically what would be your school day and this is technically what would be after school. So 
all of that is, is in teachers' minds as they're creating the playlists and supporting learning in the afternoon during, during the sort of um, asynchronous or independent learning time. Um, so in doing that, I think there's going to be less of an emphasis on homework and more of an emphasis on um, the meaningful learning needed to make sure that the students have the content and skills to have mastered a concept and to be prepared to go to the next concept. Um, if Ms. Cox would like to add to that from the perspective um, of a secondary instructor in the hybrid model, I would welcome that. Um, but I think that's sort of the, the high level summary of, of what that means. Um, I'll just add that uh, teachers are cognizant that um, more than ever students are, are sort of forced to be on computers and, and we want to make sure that they have time when they're not, um, they might be reading books, they might be, uh, you know, working on something um, off the computer um, some of the time. It's not all going to be on the computer, even though for all of us, uh, our world has, has uh, moved to the computer more than ever. Great, thanks. I will do one quick last question before we wrap up tonight. Um, textbook material for remote students, what's the plan for that? I can jump in. I think for, for us, we've talked about it as principals um, in one of our meetings. We are setting dates and times for um, pickup for those uh, materials um, for our buildings. And I know we all have different dates. We're looking, working with our teachers to see when they, the students need to have them. We have, um, <clears throat> for example, we have uh, student supply bags, horse pawn um, drawstring bags that we've been putting together. So those students who are remote will also have the same supplies as the other students. But we do recognize that our, our teachers use novels for um, reading instruction and so forth. So we're scheduling something probably within the next week or two for parent pickup. And then if you can't make that time, we can, we can work with parents. The high school we're having um, the afternoon of October 5th and October 6th devoted to the fifth will be the ninth and 10th grade students and the sixth will be for 11th and 12th grade. But if you have students that span different grades, you can come on either day. Um, and remote students will not be getting materials any later than other students. We recognize, um, you know, it's a staggered entry. So everyone will be getting materials pr basically at the same time. Uh, October, October 6th at Lawrence. Yeah, I'll be sending informa information out tomorrow for the high school. Okay, and with that, uh, thank you all for doing that. I apologize if we didn't get to all the questions. We try to get to as many of them today, so I apologize if I did not do that. The last question I'll hand off to Dr. Durr um, about the recording. Where would people be able to find that? And if there's a chat questions that weren't answered, how are and when are they going to be answered? And where right, can they I'll find start, it? Well, I'll start with the second one first. And um, so the, uh, what we did last time after the forum, uh, we did get together, answered the questions, and we cre uh, created uh, a document and we um, posted it to the website. Um, and before I sign off um, and thank people, Ryan, uh, Ryan, I'm going to throw it back to you. Where is the recording going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Up on the Falmouth Public Schools YouTube page, which if you go to the website it, with the new template is down at the bottom, big old YouTube link. All right, great. Um, thank you. And so I just um, want to first thank the panelists. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, and it, it was actually great to hear everybody and have a, um, a diverse group to be able to answer the, um, the chat questions. Um, I also want to, again, thank the parents for partnering with us. Uh, we are certainly uh, in um, very unusual and, and sometimes difficult um, situations as we're trying to open schools and make things work for everyone. And um, we couldn't have a greater community than the Falmouth community to partner with us as we are um, trying to do everything just um, for the students. And this is what it's really about. It's all for the students. So thank you for our staff, our administrators, our parents, uh, and the greater community of Falmouth that has lend a hand to help us make this work. So thank you. Bye-bye.